Hello, everyone. Today, Xiang Chen and I will give a deep dive of the Kubernetes Data Protection Working Group. My name is Xin Yang. I work at VMware in the cloud storage team. I'm also a co-chair of CNCF Tech Storage and Kubernetes Six Storage. I co-lead the Data Protection Working Group with Xiang Qian. Hello, everyone. This is Xiang Qian. Uh, I'm a software engineer in Google, focusing on storage in good GCP. Next slide, please, Xin. So today's agenda, Xin and I will go through uh, the following items. Uh, we'll talk a little bit on what are the motivations to form this data protection working group and the organizations that are involved into this group. And I will give you a little bit uh, updates on what is going on in this uh, working group. And a vast majority of the time, Shin and I will spend on deep dive into the listed components over there. Some of the components are directly driven by um, community members from the group, and some of the some of the projects are highly related to achieve or go for protecting uh, stateful workloads in Kubernetes context. And lastly, uh, Shin is going to have a slides to talk about how you can get involved into this community if you are interested. Next slide, please. So motivation. Uh, many of you have already deploy, be deploying stateful workloads into the Kubernetes environment to benefit from its rich APIs and functionalities to management to manage your uh, stateful workloads. A stateful workloads uh, can include, for example, your relational databases like MySQL or your time series databases like Prometheus, InfluxDB, NodeDB, et cetera, and key value stores and message queues, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, developers and end users achieve that via uh, Kubernetes native APIs, namely persistent volume operations, right? Persistent volume claims. Uh, you can allocate persistent volumes of an underlying storage system using the native PVC PB constructs. And also uh, to management your to manage your workload, there are APIs like deployment, stateful set, daemon set, et cetera, et cetera, which allows you to achieve automatically scale up and down your workload based off of scenarios, different scenarios. Um, more and more, we observe more and more stateful workloads are moving to Kubernetes, moving into Kubernetes environment. Uh, however, the there is apparently a gap over there for day two operations to protect your data uh, in the in this context. There are tools like GitOps, which allows you to back up your Kubernetes configuration or not, to uh, achieve application rollback when upgrade fails, for example. Uh, but little has been discovered in this effort to cover your the protection of your persistent volume data which sits on your pvcs next slide please with that uh we formed uh that the data protection working group and uh, the following organizations are highly involved in this community uh if you do see that your organization is not listed over there please feel free to reach out to shin and me and we can update the slides Next slide, please. Key updates. In the past year or two, uh, the community members have been working very hard to define the scope of the data protection working group. And this year we have published the first version of our white paper. Uh, thanks to all the community members, uh, special thanks to the authors these there were there. In, within the white paper, we are trying to define what exactly uh, data protection look like uh, in the Kubernetes context, uh, why we need that, especially in the Kubernetes environment, 
and simple use cases. For example, uh, how do we protect the application? How do we protect the namespace, et cetera? And uh, there's a couple of sections talking about what are the existing components that is available to you in Kubernetes as of today. And also sections about what are the missing building blocks in Kubernetes that kind of, you know, blocks or roadblocks for backup vendors to pro provide uh, meaningful data protection tools for these stateful workloads in Kubernetes. And, and also we try to list a lot of application specific use cases, uh, how to perform a backup and restore processes of different, like for example, databases or a message queues, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Again, this is considered to be a huge milestone of the data protection working group. Uh, if you are interested, the white paper link is in the slides. The other key major updates is that the uh, we are moving towards uh, fully supported WIM snapshot v1 APIs, and we are trying to remove the v1 beta 1 API in Kubernetes 1.24. Uh, the detailed cap has been listed over there in this slide. In short terms, uh, a non backward compatible change for uh, from V1 beta 1 to V1 has been introduced for the volume snapshot API. Uh, the There are three phases when we release the volume snapshot API from V1 beta 1 to V1 to minimize the impact on your application. Uh, but the lot, at this moment in Kubernetes 1.24, we're executing the last phrase with the phase three uh, is to deprecate the V1 beta 1 API uh, from 1.24 and onwards. Uh, the community will stop supporting V1 beta 1 API. So if your application still depends on this API, uh, please make sure uh, you do the upgrades to the V1 API as soon as possible. Uh, if any details are needed, please read through the cap. Uh, it should provide you the guidance as well as P4s, if there's any, uh, you want to avoid doing this upgrade process. Um, the last item over there is that this, today's session is gonna be very different from previous talks, which we covered in, uh, pre, uh, in many, many sessions already. Uh, if you want to look at the previous sessions, those are the links. Uh, you can find in uh, different years and different areas. Next slide, please. Now let's do some more deep dive into individual areas. The first area is this volume model convention. Uh, why we're doing this is imagine you have a, a block PVC and you take a volume snapshot of it. As of today, the volume snapshot API or the PVC construct does not prevent you from creating a file system PVC from that snapshot, even that snapshot is taken on a block device. And this is pro problematic because it, it allows the, uh, it, it brings the vulnerability to the kernel potentially. Uh, this is considered to be a, a security loophole uh, and we're trying to fix. However, the volume convention, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is actually considered to be a feature of volume snapshot API. Uh, the imagine you have a file system PVC and you took a snapshot of it, and backup vendors or even you yourself sometimes, in order to achieve efficient backup workflow, a volume backup workflow, you want to restore, rehydrate the snapshot into a block device. Uh, that way you can do block level diff calculations and only shift the changed blocks to the remote. So this is a dilemma that where on one hand, uh, we might introduce uh, vulnerability to the kernel. And on the other hand, it's kind of, you know, feature that we need it. So uh, this is something that the community tried to solve. Next slide, please. So in, uh, so we introduced this kind of changes to help uh, or mitigate the security 
concerns while still maintain the functionality. So there will be API changes in the volume snapshot content API. <clears throat> uh, source volume model field will be introduced. This field will be used to keep track of the source PVC's volume model when a snapshot is taken. Uh, uh, besides that, a system level or annotation called LR volume model change will be placed on the volume snapshot content as well. Uh, this is a Boolean annotation, uh, which allows only fours and true values. The beha behavior right now becomes if a volume model change is detected by checking the source volume model when rehydrating a volume snapshot in, into a different PVC, uh, and the new PVC has a new volume model which is different from the source volume model, the controller will automatically reject the rehydration only under the exception that the snapshot content carries the uh, allow volume model change annotation and has a true flag being set. Uh, this way, because volume snapshot content is non namespaced, only privileged personnel or the controllers who have corresponding privileges can attach such an annotation so that uh, to satisfy the feature one where uh, we want to actually rehydrate a file system PVC snapshot into a block device. Uh, this is right now uh, in checked in. Uh, next slide, please. You can find more details in the cap link over there. And there's a blog is going to be out very soon. The, right now, the plan is to enable this on alpha in 1.24, Kubernetes 1.24. Uh, special call out and shout out to uh, the dev lead, Ronak, over there. Uh, they have been putting a lot of effort to make this happen. With that, I'm shifting to Shin to continue to deep dive into other areas. Shin, thanks. Thanks, Shan Chen. I'm going to talk about volume populator. Without a volume populator, we can only create a PVC for another PVC or for another volume snapshot. But what if the backed up data is stored in a backup repository, such as an object store? The volume populator feature allows us to provision a PVC for an, an external data source, such as a backup repository. In addition, it allows us to dynamically provision a PVC, having data populated from that backup repository and honor the wait for first consumer volume binding mode during restore to ensure that volume is placed at the right node where pod is scheduled. I will talk about the components needed for volume populator. Every volume populator must have one or more CRDs that it supports. This CRD can be specified in a data source ref in a PVC. The volume populator needs to have a controller that understands this CRD. It watches PVCs with data sources pointing to the CR. When there is a request to create a PVC with the data source, the CSI driver will create an empty persistent volume first. The populator controller is responsible for filling the volume with the data based on that CR. The PVC doesn't bind to PV until it's fully populated. There are a few built-in components that facilitate the volume populator feature. There is a lib volume populator. It's a shared library for use by volume populators. Volume populator can rely on this library for Kubernetes API level work. The populator itself only needs to make sure that data is written to the volume based on the CR. There is also a sample hello populator included in the lib volume populator repo. The second built-in component is 
volume data source validator. It is a controller responsible for validating PVC data sources and generates warning events on PVCs with data sources if there is no populator. To use the volume populator feature, the any volume data source feature gate needs to be enabled. It is beta in 1.24, so the feature gate is enabled by default now. User deploys the volume data source validator controller and the volume populator. User creates a CR. Here's an example on the right-hand side. It's a hello CR. User creates a PVC with the data source pointing to this hello CR as shown on the right-hand side. The volume populator makes sure PV is created and populated with data from the data source and binds with the PVC. Ben has been leading the volume populator feature. The any volume data source alpha feature gate was introduced in 1.18 release and had a redesign in 1.22. Now it is beta in 1.24. I included references for the cap, blocks, and the repos for lib volume populator and volume data source validator. Next, I'm going to talk about CDT. This is a feature that the Data Protection Working Group is actively working on. CBT stands for Change Block Tracking. It's a feature that identifies blocks of data that have changed. It enables incremental backups to identify changes from the last previous backup, writing only changed blocks. Without CBT, backup vendors have to do full backups all the time. This is not space efficient, takes longer time to complete and need more bandwidth. Another use case is snapshot-based replication where you take snapshots periodically and replicate to another site for disaster recovery purpose. Without the ability to extract CBT, it is impossible to make snapshot-based replication a practical solution. So what are the alternatives? Without CBT, we can either do full backups or call each storage vendor's API individually to retrieve CBT, which is highly inefficient. Currently, the Data Protection Working Group is working on a design for CBT. This diagram is from the Data Protection Workflow White Paper. Here, we have a new differential snapshot service that handles CBT. It shows backup workflow that utilizes the differential snapshot service to increase backup efficiency. Let's take a look and see how this might work for block volumes. First, we create a volume snapshot of the PVC to be backed up. Then we create a new PVC, call it PVC2 using the volume snapshot as a data source. Then we query the differential snapshot service to get the list of changes between the two snapshots. For block devices, the list of changes is of the format of a list of changed blocks between the two snapshots. For file system volumes, this list of changes is changed files list between the two snapshots. We are only focusing on block volumes here. Based on this list, we can back up only change the data from the PVC2. If the list of changes cannot be obtained, then we can back up the entire volume. In the CBT design, we are proposing Kubernetes API object change blocks. There is a working progress POC for it. I will show how the proposed API look like in a minute. We are also proposing CSS back changes. It's either going to be a new capability in the existing CSS controller service 
or a new option service for differential snapshots. It will be a new CSI RPC that change blocks. We also discussed potential performance problems with this new API because change blocks could be huge. So we are also investigating how to use API aggregation to address this performance problem. Here's the proposed API. The changed blocks spec contains two snapshots handles. There is a snapshot base that is optional. There is a snapshot target that is required. Changed blocks will be the difference between these two snapshot handles and the voting ID that's optional. And we also have the uh, star offset and max entries. Those are for pagination. And uh, there is also a secrets field. This is for vendors that needs to use secrets to access snapshots. And uh, we also have uh, parameters here. This is a uh, vendor specific parameters. They are opaque key value pairs. Uh, so this is the change blocks status. In the change block status, we have change block list. And each of the change block has a context. That's the additional vendor specific information that's optional. It has a, a logical offset and the size of the block data. Those two fields are required. And uh, there's also a, a zero out, which is a Boolean. If that is true, that means this block in the snapshot target is zero out. This is uh, for some vendors who want to avoid data mover to transfer zero blocks. So here's the status of CBT. Fong has been leading this project. He has been organizing design meetings. There are also other community members who are contributing including Yvonne, Dave, Ed, and Sean, and many others. Right now, design our PVC are in progress. I added the links to the POC repo, the working progress cap, and CPT meeting minutes for your reference. Next, I will talk about backup repository. Backup repository is a location or repo to store data. This can be an object store in the cloud. It can be an on-prem storage location, or it can be an NFS-based solution. There are two types of data to be backed up that we need at the restore time. The first one is Kubernetes cluster metadata. The second one is snapshot data. We need to back them up and store them in a backup repository. Currently, there was a proposal for object store backup repository. That's the proposal for object bucket provisioning or COSI. COSI proposes object storage Kubernetes APIs to support orchestration of object store operations for Kubernetes workloads. It has APIs for bucket and bucket claim. That's like PV and PVC. It also has a, a bucket access that's for a pod to get access to the bucket. And uh, it has a bucket class that's like the storage class. There was also bucket access class. COSI also introduces gRPC interfaces for object storage providers to write drivers to provision buckets. COSI components include a COSI controller manager that binds COSI created buckets to bucket claims, similar to the binding of a, a PV to a PVC. And there's also a COSI sidecar that watches COSI Kubernetes API objects and calls COSI driver to provision buckets. And we also have a COSI driver that implements gRPC interfaces to provision buckets.
is the status of COSI. SEED has been leading the COSI project. There are also many other community members who are contributing to the project. Kubernetes COSI is already a sub-project in Six Storage. It has weekly design meetings. Cap review is in progress. We missed 1.24, so now we are targeting alpha in 1.25 release. Now I want to talk about quiet and unquiet hooks. We need these hooks to quiet application before taking snapshot and unquiet afterwards to ensure application consistency. We investigated how quiet unquiet works in different types of workloads. They have different semantics. We want to design a generic mechanism to run commands in containers, but we want to mention that application-specific semantics is out of scope for this design. We currently have a proposal called Container Notifier. CAP is submitted and it is still being reviewed. Now let's take a look and see what is proposed in the API. In this one, we are adding a container notifier list in the container type. Inside of the container notifier, there is a handler that defines a command. For example, it could be log tables for MySQL. User creates a pod notification to request a specific container notifier to be triggered. Pod notification status contains aggregated status of container notification statuses. In phase two, we are proposing a notification type. This can be used to select pods with specified notifiers to be triggered. There are also different pod selection policies. Either we can support all the pods or we can only support pre-existing pods only. We mentioned earlier that the cap is still being reviewed. Shang and I are leading this work. We talked about container notifier proposal, which tries to ensure application consistency. What if you can't acquire the application or if the application quiet is too expensive, so you want to do it less frequently, but still want to be able to take a crash consistent snapshot more frequently. Also, an application may require the snapshots from multiple volumes to be taken at the same point in time. That's when consistent group snapshot comes into a picture. There's a cap on volume group and group snapshot. It proposes to introduce a new volume group CRD that groups multiple volumes together and a new group snapshot CRD that supports taking a snapshot of all volumes in a group to ensure right order consistency. The cap is being reviewed. I'm leading this feature. We have snapshot APIs for individual volumes, but what about protecting a stateful application? There is a cap submitted that proposes a Kubernetes API that defines the notion of stateful applications and defines how to run operations on those stateful applications, such as snapshot, backup, and restore, and so on. Xiang and I are planning to pick it up this, we are going to work on this cap. This is still in a very early design stage. We talked about the features we're working on in the data protection working group. Now I'm going to talk about how to get involved. Here is the community page for data protection working group. It has information on how to get involved. We have bi-weekly meetings on Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific time. If you are interested in joining the discussions, you are welcome to join our meetings. We also have a mailing list and a Slack channel as shown here. This is the end of the presentation.
Thank you all for attending. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you.